you thought I was tuning the piano, that's not true. I was actually playing a piece called Ben Shi by Henry Cow, an American composer who wrote the piece almost 100 years ago. I know it's pretty creepy, right? <laughs> but when I first heard the piece, I was like, wow, amazing. Piano can sound like this. Crazy. And you must understand, when I heard the piece, I was 17 years old piano student at the Prodigy Curtis Institute of Music, where the school produced people like Leonard Bernstein, and, um, Gilbert, Ellen Gilbert, and Shura Tchaikovsky, and many, many amazing, amazing musicians. And uh, I started playing piano when I was three years old for like <laughs> eight to 10 hours a day. And I, I won my first uh, international competition when I was 12. And I got in Curtis when I was 13. So uh, when I was 17, I was ready to graduate from my college degree. And after 14 years of serious piano training crossing two continents, and then I heard something like this for the first time in my life, it just blew my mind. I must perform this piece, I told myself. And I ended up programming this piece as the last piece of my graduation recital at Curtis. Um, I had to program it as the last piece because I was playing all inside the strings and uh, it would rip off the layers of skins on my fingertips. So <laughs> I couldn't play anything after that, but it was worth it. Um, the piece really opens new windows to me. You know, for the first time I realized in my life, I don't have to play the same pieces over and over again. And the thing is, the classical piano repertoire has maybe like a hundred, a few hundred pieces maximum. And then you hear your classmates play them, your teachers play them, famous uh, pianists play them in concerts, and then I need to play them. <laughs> and I was like, I love music, but what's the point? What's the point? <laughs> now this was different because it's actually something new. I realized I can play something new and even inside the piano. And some people might say like, ah, contemporary music, that's not real music. But guess what? Beethoven was a contemporary. Schumann was a contemporary pianist and composer, and so were like Mozart, Haydn, and Chopin, and Brahms, and Liszt, and you name it. All the composers, they were writing for each other and playing each other's music, and you know, just, it's just natural. And every generation, composers continue to push boundaries, to create, to be cutting edge, and even to compose inside the instruments. So over the years, I asked myself, what's the true purpose of being an artist for me? Uh, especially a performing artist. You want to hear what I got? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> a no will be a problem. <laughs> so I thought art needs to reflect the current stage of, of our world. We need to raise awareness in people on the pressing social issues. And it's something an artist could do to make a difference. That's why I created this um, global warming program called Aqua Alta with NASA scientist Ian Fenty using NASA's data visualizations. And I commissioned many composers all over the world to write for the data to express their own feelings uh, through mu their music on this very pressing issue. And also to better integrate arts and science. So now I'm going to perform one of the pieces from Aqua Alta for you.
thank you. <laughs> now I'm uh, activated. <laughs> Now, you can say that I'm a person who blurs the, between the line of classical and contemporary music. But I think I'm just going where music history is naturally going. It's like evolution. And as a contemporary pianist, I find it's my responsibility to choose the right pieces to play. The more they're played, the higher chance they will last in music history. Now, composers write for me. We develop pieces together. We even develop AI technology together for visuals and electronic music to play with me. So here, this is my dear friend and longtime collaborator, Yaroslav Kapuscinski, who's the chair of Stanford Music Department. I call him Yarek. And this is us developing AI technology at IRCAM in Paris. IRCAM is one of the best music research center for music and technology in the world. And many people play multimedia music, but it's often with pre-recorded videos, so the performer just follows the video. And, but that's not enough. A performer wants her utmost freedom to express her musicality, and, uh, you know, I want to have my rubatos. And it's a key difference between live music and recordings. So that's why Enteskofo is invented. Enteskofo is an um, AI real-time software. It follows the music in real time with AI algorithms to recognize every note within 10 to 20 milliseconds, every note I play. So it basically is predicting every note I'll play in real time. And the pieces are written that way that's matching the visuals note by note. So uh, if I take a longer pause while I'm performing, the video will wait for me also. And if, uh, you know, this, uh, as a solo pianist, the visual element gives me a lot more a wider range of expressivity. As Enteskofo's inventor, Arsha Kant said, let technology serve art, not the other way around. Technology in our era is inevitable. However, there are many faces of technology. We need to be more aware of the good and bad of technology and to actually take better control to use technology to serve humanity. It's funny because it actually just happened to me. I was supposed to perform at the World AI Conference that just happened in Shanghai. And uh, <laughs> guess what? You won't believe it. I was replaced by robots. So <laughs> the final decision was that they, don't want, they wanted uh, robots to, to play the piano instead of a real pianist playing the piano. <laughs> so I guess I'm probably the first pianist in the world whose concerts are replaced by robots. You know, so so I mean, that's just one tiny funny example of human vs. robots or technology. But as Andrew Yen these days are talking about a lot, that you know, 80% and basically millions of job loss are happening in the U.S. due to automation. So this is something we all need to think about in the future. Technology has already affected us in many ways daily lives. If you go out for dinner and you look around in restaurants, you see. You will see, actually. <laughs> just do it next time. Like, how many people are just doing this? You know, they're just like on their phones and not talking to each other. And I often wonder, it's like, well, then why do you go, go out at all? Why do you still go out? Is it because we still need to sort of do what, you know, hundreds and thousands of years, you know, since human existence, we still need to like kind of bond and socialize, but we're too addicted to put our phones down for a couple of hours? And social media has really given us the illusion that we're connecting. Now we feel like we can connect to the whole world while we're sitting in our bedrooms. And we feel like we're in control of our lives. But you know, that's just an illusion. The social media inventors want us to feel that way. But in reality is that we are just being tricked. We're brainwashed, calculated by uh, Las Vegas casino slot machine AI algorithms. And then, you know, so these companies can go on to the stock market using our data. So love, connection, and empathy are the true needs of human beings. 
the digital era just misleads us to think that we can achieve all this by technology. But all psychologists know if you make a video call, you can't see the full body language of the other person. You can't see his or her breathing, thinking with yours. You can't see his irises enlarging. So human beings actually need to connect on a much, much deeper level that's physical, intuitive, and also subconscious. Believe it or not, technology is also damaging our love lives. So psychologist Dr. Alexandra Solomon in her book Loving Bravely said, now what we are doing, we're just listening while texting, texting while watching a show, watching a show while scrolling Facebook, and we seem to really put our whole self at one time in one place. And technology gives us the illusion that we can get always more, more dating profiles, you know, as long as you keep swipe, swiping, and it's fast and easy and efficient. But this is not true love. True love requires real listening, real real listening, real growth, you know, real presence. And all that takes time. And Solomon calls the face-to-face -face undivided attention, the big, B, big P presence, and the small, you know, through technology micro interactions, the small P presence, like Facebook pokes and <laughs> likes. So uh, for me, performing art is a great way to uh, resurrects this big P presence. Because when I'm giving a concert or while we are going to a concert, it's really about truly listening, truly sharing, and truly feeling. Live music is a moment form. The moment only exists when I'm performing a piece of music for you. And you know, you have the chance to just sit down, listen, let music take you wherever you want to go, let music make you feel whatever you want to feel. And I had audiences who came to me after my concert. They said, I never thought I even had these feelings ever before. I never experienced these feelings in my life until now. And that's what makes it worthwhile. Performing art is truly an undisturbed moment for sharing and self-reflection. It's like uh, another form of meditation. And unfortunately, now, when we are at concerts, so many people are just like so busy posting snapshots and posting on WeChat moments and Facebook, saying, hey, you know, let others know, I'm at a concert. But who's really listening? And so that's why some Chinese concert halls, they have to shut the phone signals so people will actually just quiet down for a moment. But it's, it's ridiculous. But it's also terrifying. And how many of us are aware of this? The music school I created in Shanghai nine years ago with Polish pianist Peter Thomas called uh, Facer Institute of Music. We have a mission that is creativity and human interaction. We started our co-creation festival where students play for their teachers, play with their teachers, and write for films, and also compose different instruments for chamber music, more than piano. And at the end of the festival, everybody goes on stage and performs for every everyone their personal creations. We also open classes like music literature and music technology, and also ethno-music composition. So as media theorist Douglas Rushkoff said, we have to stop using technology to optimize human beings for the market and start optimizing technology for the future of our humanity. In other words, we should let technology serve art, creativity, and imagination, and culture. The final piece I'd like to play for you is written by my friend Yarek. And it's especially written for me, and it's uh, based on an ancient Chinese story called Bo Ya Sui Qing. So there, it's about uh, the love between two musicians and their true love for each other and for music. So one person was called Zi Qi and another person called Bo Ya. So when Bo Ya found out that Zi Qi had died, he broke his instrument. He said, without my true listener, I will never play again. So this piece is also about a dance between Chinese calligraphy and piano. I hope by using technology to assist music performance and create new music together, I'm doing the right thing. 
Now I welcome you to put down your phones and uh, to put down your phones and <laughs> to truly experience this moment with me.